today we are physically dispersed. We gather virtually. So I would like us to take a moment together to reflect the meaning of place. In doing so, we recognise the various traditional lands from which we join together today. We acknowledge the elders, past and present, of all the land on which we work and live and listen to their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. We acknowledge these unceded lands and the ongoing connection to lands, sea and community. For this is and always will be Aboriginal land. Please now take a moment to join me in acknowledging the traditional lands that you are on and respectfully honour the custodians who continue to care for country. He honore, he karore, he maungaro ki te whenua, he whakaro pai ki nga tāngata katoa. Huri nō mai tēnei pito, o, a, ki tēnā pito, ki tērā pito. Ki nga tāngata whenua o te ao, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It's a great honour on behalf of Māori here in Aotearoa to acknowledge us all and the sovereign unceded lands we stand on, the waters, mountains and forests that sustain us, the ancestors whose dreams have inspired us and the future generation for whose rights we fight. How wonderful it is to be gathered together for another Lyme connection, albeit electronically, uh, in this really extraordinary time in world history that we find ourselves in. May our connection be fun and fabulous, authentic and creative, powerful and provocative, healing and radical. Tēnā koutou kato. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Lilon Bandler and I'm the facilitator for today's session. I'd like to start by acknowledging I join you from the land of the Gurungai of Northern Sydney, south of Newcastle on the east coast of Australia. And I also acknowledge the communities I serve and work with in Western New South Wales, the Barkindji, the Muri Muri, the Wiliakali, Nyampa, the Wadagali, the Malangaba and the Wankumara. I pay my respects to elders past and to elders present and recognise and acknowledge the ongoing work of Indigenous people here in Australia and in Aotearoa. Thank you all for joining us today to hear from this remarkable panel of early career Indigenous medical professionals. I have some housekeeping tasks I need to walk through and then I will hand over to them. So just a, reminding, uh, just a reminder that we are recording this session um, and it will be available for viewing later. Um, conversations and questions, of course, will always be respectful, but just keep in mind that they are recorded. Please do share on social media with the tag Lime Staying Connected, uh, but don't share your passwords. Instead, encourage your friends and your colleagues to register uh, through the Lime Connection website. And through that, you will also have um, the ability to connect with other people who, who have attended Lyme Connection 9, and um, there will be um, access to their contact details if you would like to use them. Um, please, through this session, you know, we've got a lot of people online across two nations, and if there are any technical problems, don't hesitate to um, contact us by email. Um, the LINE team will be watching for you and will help out as best we can. 
Um, we will also um, be accepting questions throughout the session. There's a um, Q&A tag at the bottom of your screen and you're more than welcome to um, use that to um, post any quick questions that you'd like. And, and sometimes people post comments as well and you're more than welcome to. Um, and, uh, you know, really, I, I'd encourage you to engage with the conversation um, and um, and uh, come to this session um, to hear from a group of people who bring new eyes to things. Um, as you can see from um, my hair, I'm an old person and I've been in this um, for some time now and I always look forward to and, and enjoy the opportunity to hear from people who are not quite as battle weary. Um, I, I guess um, I should just outline what we'll do today. Um, initially, each of the um, panellists will um, introduce themselves a, a little bit um, and then talk a bit to the question that has been posed for today. And, um, and then um, we'll open it up more broadly to a discussion. And, and of course, we will welcome your questions um, from, from the attendees. Um, so let me begin by just um, briefly reminding you um, about what the question actually is. Um, so, and it's a question that I think many of you will have had to have thought about in your own work environment. And many of you will um, have that as an ongoing question throughout your professional uh, life. And it's something that people have to think about. I've been assured by um, my colleague, Dr. Priest, that it's an important question to ask. And I think it is. And um, Dr. Clanton has also pointed out that there are three parts to the question, and perhaps that will help us um, navigate through it a little. Um, so to open this, you, you, if you've read people's bios, you will see that this is not your average group of young medical professionals. Um, and, um, and many of them have had a number of um, work placements and work opportunities and careers, in fact, uh, before coming to medicine. And I think that helps inform some of what they'll be talking about today. So let me start by handing over to Dr. Dalton. Um, he's a GP registrar in Perth, and I'm sure he'll tell you a little more about himself. And um, I hand it over to you now. Thanks, Prof. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'd just like to start off by acknowledging the country that I'm on up here in uh, Perth, uh, the Wajak Noongar Buja people, and uh, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And it's a privilege to be working here um, with the mob. Um, uh, just a bit about myself. Mera Mara Nunta Interlangu uh, so I've been learning my language and I really wanted to say it <laughs> smoothly today, but it's, it's not coming to me. Eba Tedingu Aranda. So I'm, I'm Corey. I'm from the Western Aranda uh, regions of uh, Northern Territory, uh, but living here in WA and working. Um, and as the Prof mentioned, I'm a GP registrar, completing some hospital training um, this year um, up in the Northern suburbs of Perth at Joondalup Hospital. Uh, I want to I suppose posing this question, and like Dr. Clanton um, pointed out, and, and uh, we really, really split into the three phases, and I suppose I bring it from my journey. Um, and I like the fact that the Prof mentioned that we're young. Some are, me not so much. I came into medicine a little bit later in life. I was 42 when I graduated. Um, but I think that really gave me, um, I suppose, a leg up in regards to the experience and transferable skills that I could bring into being a young doctor. Um, when you look at the right place, start, start with that part of the question, you know, the internship is pretty well planned out from you. Have you, you mapped out um, areas that you need to work in, gen search, gen med, ED, et cetera. Um, so you don't really have also a choice in the teams that you work with essentially, but you do have some consideration, I think, to where you're gonna work. And for me, um, it was looking at my student places and I implore you to have a look at that 
and those exposures that you have to help make that decision. Um, because what it does, it gives you, I think, three key things to look at. Workplace culture, um, the Indigenous health and the actual practice in healthcare that that organisation has, and the rotation availability for your career progression and pathway. So for me, team structure, um, more so looking at, you know, not the us versus them, the doctor versus nurses, all those sorts of things. It was like, I want to work in a team where everyone works collaboratively. We all have one job um, to look after our, our patients. Um, and seeing that collaboration really makes a difference in the workplace. Um, from the um, Indigenous health and, and practice, I looked and uh, really focused on a, a hospital that I chose to go to that probably I felt at the time had the best um, Aboriginal health workforce, um, but also looked at the Aboriginal healthcare team that then the health workers they had was um, brilliant. I had a really close working relationship with them. It really helped me connect with patients. Um, and there was a good cultural identity um, that was felt in the hospital. And that's really important, I think, as an Indigenous doctor starting out new to make sure that you keep that connection and you've got some like-minded professionals that are surrounding you. And rotation availability, I, I looked at a place that offered paediatrics and internship, um, which I was successful to get, thankfully. And, and that was um, something that helped me progress um, to my GP training. Um, work environment, I think um, you've got to, like we said, you've got to feel safe. Um, as an intern and an RMO, you're still learning and um, you are going to get things wrong, um, but that's okay because you should be in a protected space where you have your senior doctors looking out for you. Um, but you've got to make sure that that environment, again, picking the right people to mentor you um, informally or formally um, give you that protection. There's lots of stresses as a junior doctor when you start and you know there's and we all know in medical school there's lots of stresses there too but um, it sort of changes because you go from one day in that old age if you are the medical student and then tomorrow you're the doctor and sometimes you are the only doctor on that ward and you've got a team of allied health professionals, nursing, orderlies, patients all asking you the questions. So psychological stress is going to be there. So you've got to give yourself um, the ability to unpack that. I think um, clinical leaders um, do really value building that trust um, with them. So have a really good communication technique, build rapport with your clinical leaders, whether it's consultants, registrars, um, nurse managers, allied health professionals, have that network um, happening early in your career and when you start that placement. Um, you're at the peak of your knowledge when you start med school, um, unfortunately, and then it's sort of, you know, depending on where you work, you do lose some, so you've got to keep yourself abreast of things. Um, workload, it can be very hectic as a junior doc. Um, you've got to draw the line when it comes to extra hours, those sorts of things, you're going to do some, but make sure that you set the scene early um, and, you know, realise some teams, cultures can put undue expectation for um, as a junior doctor that you must do extra unpaid hours but really look at that and talk to your peers about that. I think it's important to um, make sure you have a work-life balance. Um, you know, there's studies out there with um, us as apprentice doctors, so to speak, that um, you need to build your confidence. To do that, you've got to start taking on responsibilities, um, build your empathy with your patients and your patient care, and um, look at the social context in regards to healthcare, looking after your patients, especially from the Indigenous patient perspective. Go to your teaching, um, you know, it, uh, the, the senior doctors, again, will, will help you build your knowledge base informally um, on the rounds. Um, know your craft. I think the, the best thing is really building up your self-efficacy and, and knowing your craft as a junior doctor. So understand the basics. If you get those right in the early part, you'll, you'll build on that and become a very good junior doctor. Um, the right supports, um, for me, um, working in organisations that gave me uh, exposure um, to um, informal and formal mentors is probably one of the best things I've had. So th they don't have to be in the workplace. Um, you've got people like us here on the panel that are more than willing, I'm sure, to be um, mentors to people. Um, really seek that advice. Um, it does help you 
Um, some of the research I did prior to coming into medicine was looking at newcomer socialization in workplaces for indigenous um, employees. And the biggest thing is role clarity, self-efficacy and social acceptance. If you, you know, if you think about it and unpack that for, from your own experiences, that really does um, form, I suppose, that platform of fitting into a workplace. Um, the other thing is family and friends. I don't know about you, Mob, but my family are brutally honest when it comes to things and um, listen to what they say and what they tell you. Um, take it on board. And uh, from there, that will help you if, you're, if they see you getting too stressed, if you're working too much, um, they will help you steer the ship, so to speak. Your intern and peers, very important. Um, you, your colleagues will provide you with feedback if they feel that you're struggling or you need, or you're doing well both ways. Um, it helps create that social exchange. You build those relationships. Um, social exchange in an organisation is very important for you as a junior doctor. Um, it's very important for me as a junior, a junior doctor. Um, bring your lived experiences to the workplace. Uh, they go a long way. Um, culturally, I think we, um, as Indigenous doctors, we do this very well. We're good communicators. Um, we know how to build our relationships and, and you can use those with your non-Indigenous colleagues, those skills, and, and um, that really holds you in good stead um, as one of the team members, I think. Um, you know, mentoring for me, for example, um, gave me great direction. Um, there, I had a formal mentor that was able to link me into one of the directors from the RACGP here in WA that really gave me some solid advice to becoming a GP that helped me form that decision um, to, to, be a, to be a GP. So, you know, take that on board. And I think lastly, um, your own emotional intelligence. You know, we all look and talk, look at this and talk about it in medicine. You do have to have self-reflection. Um, it helps you, especially on the difficult days. We are a competitive bunch personality-wise, I think, as doctors. And we, we can sometimes have that imposter syndrome and feel unworthy, but you do belong. You're here for a reason. Um, the, you've got to run at your own pace. Um, reflect on your experience, your experience in itself, with your team members um, and with your colleagues. I think um, that will help you with your accomplishments in the future. Thanks, Prof. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, might I just take a moment to um, congratulate you? on your appointment to the Board of Australian Indigenous Doctors Association. Fantastic, fantastic appointment and, 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 and a worthy person to be on that board. Thank you. Thank you so and much. Thank you for that fantastic start to our conversation. Um, I'm going to hand now to Dr. Robinson, um, who's um, up in the north of Australia, where it's extremely hot. Um, and um, the, the platform is yours. Thanks, Prof. Na mir bookmark ngara yako lunguruma. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda. My traditional name is Lunguruma, and uh, my family is from up in the Northern Territory, uh, Galawinku Way uh, or Elko Island. Um, I'm talking today from Darwin, which is a uh, Larrakia country. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Larrakia people, and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, and also um, just to extend my respect to all the other Indigenous people and everyone here today. Um, this was a very thought provoking question. Uh, which I thought very long and hard about. Um, not sure if I came up with the solution in the end, but um, I, uh, like Corey, am not a young doctor. I've come to medicine later in life after uh, having a couple of different careers. I'm sorry, there's a lawnmower going outside as well. So, <laughs> um, and but I came to medicine uh, with a very clear goal of practicing in rural and remote medicine and Aboriginal medicine, which is. I was very passionate about right from the go again. Um, and this passion is largely driven by my own experiences growing up in um, remote Aboriginal communities and seeing the poor health, the um, premature deaths, the 
social injustices uh, of my own, you know, that my own family experienced and, um, you know, that I saw in other community members. Um, I also worked quite extensively in Aboriginal communities over the years in different capacities and, um, you know, from all different parts of Australia. I guess I, so, so I came to medicine with a very strong idea of what I wanted to do and what I believed, um, you know, the goal I wanted to have, which was to improve Aboriginal health. Um, and I do that in a very sort of heart-centred way, I guess, um, which also, you know, drives the way that I want to achieve those goals. Um, so I'm now working in my first year as a GP registrar up here in the Northern Territory, and I've completed two rotations so far, one being a FIFO job, which was involved flying to three uh, remote communities. And um, I'm currently working in an Aboriginal medical health service. Um, one of these jobs I really loved and felt like sort of, you know, I'd found my place more or less, the other one, not so much. Um, which would have made me reflect on, you know, why that was so, you know, why did I feel very strongly about one job and wasn't really sort of feeling the other job, um, which sort of leads into our question. Um, and I think the answer for me is that, you know, when I really think about my past experiences about my, uh, um, you know, what I want to achieve in the future in order to find the right place, you know, the right work environment, the right support and peace of mind for me personally to move forward in my career. I think it's vitally important that the people that I work with, um, the organisation that I work for, uh, the structures and so forth that are in place, they need to share similar values and philosophies to my own, you know, um, I think uh, ultimately that needs to have a deep respect for the culture, for the particular community and an understanding of the community. I'm so sorry about that, Moa. <laughs> I don't know how loud it is from your end. Um, uh, and have a respect for the Aboriginal culture and the complex nature of Aboriginal health and, um, and have good work ethics surrounding that, which is something that's very important to me as well. But fundamentally, I think for me, it's important to find that environment where other people actually care, um, which is something that's, uh, you know, very important for me. So the people I work with, the um, environment I work in, it's at the end of the day, it's what's important to me most is that they care about what they're doing. They care about the culture, they have respect for Indigenous peoples and actually genuinely want to make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. That, yes, I, I think uh, working beside people who care um, can provide you with a daily impetus to keep going. Thank you for your opening remarks. Um, We'll stay in the north of Australia, in Darwin for now, where he is for now. Um, and I'll hand down to you, Dr. Kane. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Bandler. Um, and thank you to the Lyme Network for having me. Um, I've attended a couple of Lyme conferences now. And before studying medicine, I worked for the Indigenous Doctors Association and had a close working relationship with the Lyme crew. So um, it's a pleasure to be on the other side now. Um, my name's Justin Kane. I'm a Gamilaroi and Ewan man from New South Wales. Um, Mum's mob's from Moree, northwest New South Wales, and our family grew up on the Mihai Mission and Top Camp there. And our mob's the traditional owners of the Warren Bungles National Park, where a lot of people um, seem to visit. Um, my dad also hails from down the south coast of New South Wales, um, from Wadi Wadi Ewan country, a little village called Rec Bay Village in Jervis Bay National Park. Um, and that's my ancestry um, on both my parents' side. Um, I'm working as a surgical registrar um, here at Royal Darwin Hospital in Larrakee country. Um, and I've been here since January this year. Um, prior to that, um, I worked as a junior doctor in Sydney at St Vincent's Hospital and doing a rotation to Wagga Wagga Hospital. 
and then also working at Royal North Shore Hospital last year as a vascular surgery registrar. Um, this year I've been selected to um, onto the vascular surgery training program um, and as far as I'm aware I'm the only Aboriginal person to ever have done that so I'm a bit stoked with that and I'd want to take um, pay my respects to Kelvin Kong, um, Professor Kelvin Kong, who was the first Aboriginal surgeon, um, without whom, um, and also to our Maori brothers and sisters from Aotearoa, who have also paved the way for people like me to get on. Um, this question really, um, really hit home for me, and I thought it was an excellent question and very relevant to my current practice. Um, so, Last year, I made the decision that, you know, I'd finally had enough of working in metropolitan hospitals, um, working in large centres where actually not a lot of Aboriginal patients would be presenting. Um, and I felt that um, over the course of my junior doctor years, or well, the time that I spent in Sydney, I felt like I was losing sight of my purpose of why I wanted to get into vascular surgery. Um, and so I decided to come to the Northern Territory um, and I have loved every minute of it um, ever since. Being here on Larrakee country um, and working with the Aboriginal patients of the top end um, has been rewarding um, in so many different aspects of my life um, that um, there's too many to talk about um, for this session. But it makes me think about this question and, you know, as a junior doctor, there's three things that I think about um, with regards to finding the right place um, or three things to think about for yourself. Um, and the first thing is social support. Um, and um, the second thing is mentorship. And the last thing is purpose. Um, and I feel like this is important throughout all stages of your career and training pipeline. And I've found that myself. Um, so coming up um, as a young, young guy applying for medical school, um, like all due respect to Dr. Bandler, I remember she interviewed me for medical school at the University of Sydney, but um, I subsequently went to the University of Wollongong. And reasons for me choosing that was because, you know, my mobs from South Coast, New South Wales, Wollongong Uni was home territory. I had a very strong social support um, and I had um, a community there as well. And so that was important to me. And I felt like with, with that um, support, I was able to com like comfortably complete medical school without having to worry about being isolated. Um, throughout my journey, I feel that um, mentorship has been important as well. And so thinking of places to work and, um, and professions to be in, um, I feel that mentorship has been a particularly critical part of my training. Um, I've been blessed to have a lot of mentors from a lot of different surgical specialties, not just vas vascular surgery, and also non-surgical specialties. And so as, as a first in family, young Aboriginal doctor coming through the system without having any prior experience in the system, whenever I make a decision and whenever I seek feedback from my mentors about what to do, I feel, I feel reassured and I feel confident then because the decision that I make then has a cumulative 200, year, 200 plus years of experience that helps me make informed decisions moving forward in my career and in my life. And then the final thing um, is, is purpose. And I think being a young junior doctor, or not even young, just being a junior doctor, young Aboriginal doctor coming through the system um, and Maori doctor for that fact, um, coming through the system, we, I feel like we have a strong cultural backbone in that, you know, there's, there's a purpose as to why we're seeking medical careers. For me, choosing vascular surgery, um, unfortunately, a lot of mob are overrepresented um, within the statistics around vascular disease. Um, and a part of the reason why I've chosen this specialty is because I know that I can make a difference in this specialty more so than any other surgical specialty. And I feel that um, there is so much potential or room to um, improve vascular surgery services with regards to things like um, arteriovenous fistulas and to 
um, managing chronic diabetic foot wounds, um, that's important to me. And so coming to a place where I get to work with mob every day, um, I get to work with people who share the same culture as me. Um, and what's unique about our mob here in Australia is that there's 600 different language groups or tribes. Um, and it's lovely getting to learn other mobs languages, other mobs traditions and customs, and then getting to a stage where I've actually been able to visit communities and visit um, a lot of the places in the top end to share advice around, um, around vascular surgery health promotion, which has been meaningful to me. So thinking of places to work um, and thinking about peace of mind, I think working in a place where you feel like you're making a difference is critical. So thinking about the patient the, and the patient population you work with, thinking about the institution, like what Corey was saying, what the Indigenous health teams like, what the hospital's ethos is like is important um, and making sure it's a safe environment for not just us, but the patients we look after. Um, and finally, working with people that share similar values to you. Um, and so for me, I've written a couple of things down here, but you know, people who are respectful, people who have humility, um, people who are also very fun as well. I think you can't have a team and you can't work in a place without having without having some enjoyment. And the final thing is um, people who are passionate. So people who are passionate about their purpose and why they choose to work in a place like Darwin or Perth or other places um, is very important. And so that's me in a nutshell. So I think that this is very relevant to me in my experience, particularly in the last 12 months. And I think that, you know, thinking about through all layers of the medical education pipeline, thinking about institutions that you're interested in working in and thinking about the team you're working in as well. Um, it's all important in, in terms of progressing professionally. And, and if I haven't had the experience I've had in the last 12 months, I feel like I wouldn't have been selected to the training program and that I wouldn't have succeeded now. Um, and that's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move from um, Northern Australia to Western Australia, and um, I'll hand over to my colleague, who I've known for many years now, um, to Dr. Talila Melroy, who is based in Perth um, and is, a, is also a GP registrar. Thanks. Thanks, Lila. Um, I, I'd also just like to start by acknowledging the Noongar Wadjuk people whose land where I'm broadcasting to you from today. Um, I am, as Lilon said, a GP registrar, but I did my um, training, my medical school and um, internship residency in Sydney and um, yeah, moved across here to, to be with family. Um, again, I just echo um, everybody else in saying that I think this question was really important. And for me, this session, I think, um, is really about what's unique to Indigenous doctors and trainees. And it's important because we know how unique our experiences are. And we know we face challenges like racism and cultural loading, but we also know we have unique motivations and unique worldviews and perspectives. And the way that we approach patient care and care of communities is grounded, as has already has been said, in our cultures and our sense of reciprocity. Um, so when I think of the, the right place, I think of where I can feel grounded um, in myself. And for me, family fulfills my social and emotional needs. So at various times, places where I can be most connected to my children, um, my husband and my extended family. So in the most practical sense, place comes with convenience. Um, and I think as medical professionals, and especially if um, your drive is Indigenous health, you're automatically very giving of yourself. And so I like to find places that I add value to, but also that I draw value from. And usually that surrounds how does this place fit with me and my life and what I hold with significance. And then similarly, like the right work environment comes with flexibility. So having grown up in Perth, but completed high school and uni in Sydney, then moving back to Perth, I've found ways to connect with country and family when these things have been 
more transient, but the right work environment really allows the flexibility to take the time to connect with these support systems and ground myself. Um, and I also value work environments where I'm able to contribute to ideas surrounding system or organisational change and particularly, for example, in the clinical setting, how to improve care for Aboriginal patients um, or improving cultural safety for patients. Um, and if I imagine my ideal work environment, it is culturally safe for me and my patients. And um, it includes the value of professional development for all staff surrounding cultural safety, removal of cultural loading for me in the professional space, things like cultural leave allowances and flexibility in work hours to allow teaching and research, connection with family and valuing of my role as a mother and daughter, a sister and a granddaughter. Um, and in addition to the removal of cultural loading, I want my knowledge of Aboriginal health to be valued, but equally, I want my skills and knowledge of medicine itself to be valued. And so um, if I think about the right supports, I think these come from personal, professional and organisational levels. And I've mentioned family already as a key support. Um, but professionally, I personally gravitate more to female mentorship and support. And I think you find um, the, the supports sometimes in incidental ways, but overall my mentorship comes from people I admire and they have values and they have strength that I hope to emulate. Um, and that helps me feel strong and motivated and, and also not alone in my own kind of frustrations and insecurities in some of the environments that we we work in um, but in, from an organizational level I think generally that comes from embedding in networks of people like Lyme um, and groups or committees that value your perspectives allow you to contribute and see a place for you into the future um, and it also comes with being no, notified and included in emerging opportunities for career progression um, professional development both in and out of the Aboriginal health space um, and I think um, in terms of um, peace of mind in progressing professionally, um, I, sp I spoke earlier about how things can sometimes be transient um, and that includes, you know, some of the supports and, and people um, in your life. But peace of mind is like that for me also. I think all health professionals have days where we leave feeling kind of ready to give up. And there are some days in clinic where I just have to kind of stop and pause and breathe because it's been overwhelmingly busy or stressful but I find more and more the rewarding days are more rewarding than the stressful days are stressful and as flawed as some of our medical training can be I think there's unseen ways that our clinical skills and knowledge and creativity and problem solving develop and when these aspects become stronger you can really appreciate some more of the smaller moments um, and I think that the motivation required to reflect on how you want to progress professionally comes from seeing changes are happening and that you can make a tangible difference to a patient or a medical student or an organisation or a system. So overall, I think it's really the, the small wins and the small successes that kind of lead you forward and nudge you to an end goal that gets closer, even if you're not quite sure what that end goal is. And um, Lilon spoke earlier about the battle weary kind of older people, but I think we really have to respect that knowledge that's come before us. And um, it's, it's, and, and also not, not be disheartened that <laughs> these, these battles have been ha happening for such a long time and just, you know, ho hope that, you know, cha change is coming. It's on the horizon. <laughs> It'll come at some point. Um, but yeah, thanks to everyone that's spoken so far. And I think, um, yeah, we're, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, really kind of positive and common themes coming through. So yeah, I appreciate everyone's time this morning. Um, thank you. And um, I should add, um, the last time I was speaking to Dr. Milroy was um, during a um, book club meeting. Um, so uh, she has a, a multiplicity of skills and interests. Um, like all of our panellists, in fact. Um, our next um, panellist is also in Perth, um, and I'll hand over to you, if I might, um, Dr Clanton. Hi, Lyme Mort. Hello, uh, Lyme family. Um, as 
professor said, my name is Deja. I'm an Aboriginal and African American woman currently based in WA. Um, my grandmother's country extends from Wongatha Yamaji country and my grandfather is Noongar Gija. Um, I'm speaking to you from Wajat Noongar Buja, so I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, as we continue to honour and be our ancestors' wildest dreams. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on the panel today. I, um, as well as Dr. Kane and Dr. Dalton, I've had um, a long relationship with Lyme, both as a student um, and professionally. So it's great to be on the other side. Um, we discussed this question in detail prior to today's event. And like we said, it's um, you can tackle it in multiple ways. I think it's very multifaceted and, and different angles. Um, so I'll approach it in regards to experiences and I'm aware of the audience in which we have um, and it's more uh, kind of encouraging or um, thought provoking to the academics um, listening to the panel um, discussions today. So I will start with the right place and, and environment. Um, I agree with my colleagues, Dr. Dalton and Dr. Kane when they say um, people and culture. Um, coming from a corporate space, you do need to find your tribe, um, people who share the same um, ambitions, values, um, and core kind of um, and, um, drives that you want to see the change in your environment. But I'm also very aware that um, we don't talk a lot about the energies that it requires to, <clears throat> excuse me, change a person's attitude towards the environment. So when I say that, I say um, it's about encouraging young Indigenous doctors and young Indigenous professionals to actually occupy their space um, and do it unapologetically um, without necessarily asking for permission. Um, <laughs> that, that can seem quite radical, but I think when we go into these spaces, um, the power to um, own your power on your space and do it unapologetically sends almost a ripple effect on the people you uh, kind of attract um, and the environment you kind of create around you. Um, and also be very aware, I think um, academics and colleagues are unaware that when we do enter these spaces, there is um, uh, un the unwillingness to ex uh, uh, Kind of self-reflect on the fact that you might need to ask the question at, um, of my Indigenous colleague, do I think they're the race representative? No, we're not. Um, by having an Indigenous doctor, we're not automatic saviours. We can't, um, there's not enough conversation of just because I'm an Indigenous doctor, it doesn't mean I'm going to engage and speak to every Indigenous patient the same. I think you need to break it down to what are the key communication skills required. Um, and two, we enter these spaces um, to advance professionally um, and, like I said, own and be um, unapologetic in our space. Uh, so, you know, we don't necessarily want to be the poster child either. And I can't speak on behalf of my colleagues, but I've had very much um, a lot of encounters through my journey where people think I'm the race representative. People think by just me like having me on the floor they're almost saved and I can speak to and engage in every, with every Indigenous patient that walks through the door um, and then I'm the poster child so um, just some things to to think about um, when you um, uh, kind of talk about our journeys um, as a kind of where to from now um, we talk about the battle wary and the cultural loading and things like that. Um, when colleges are, you know, uh, kind of trying to get Indigenous doctors into programs and um, into the pathways, um, think about the journey that the young Indigenous doctor or Indigenous doctor has taken to get there in the first place. There's a lot of uh, extra things as a young Indigenous doctor, we have to navigate um, and find our ways through, um, whether it be microaggressions and the, um, uh, the kind of complexities of the current structures of the health system, the extra energy it requires to actually get there, um, to 
kind of invigorate that and continue to keep that fire in the belly takes a lot of energy and to do it gracefully as well. I think it's something that we need to continue to have the discussion on. And that kind of leads me into the supports. Like my colleagues have said, it's family, community um, and professional supports. The best advice I received going or starting this journey um, was from one of my dear friends and mentors. He knows who he is, so I won't shame him out. But he said, Deja, wherever you, wherever you end up, you'll be needed. Um, and I think that needs to be encouraged more um, in regards to there's so much pull because there's so few of us um, from our families, um, our communities, um, the, the hospitals, um, and then the colleges. Um, and we don't necessarily stop and say, what sparks the fire in your belly? And the question I pose to the audience is, when you think of an Indigenous doctor, what's the first thing that pops to your mind? And if it's not something like a vascular surgeon, like my brother, Dr. Kane, why not? Um, why not? And so those are the pathways and conversations that we need to be kind of encouraging and um, supporting much more. Um, so, <laughs> uh, again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to talk. So I hope, hopefully I've um, planted a, a few kind of talking points for later. Um, but just to summarise the fact that, one, it's very much the people that make the place, but it's also empowering our young Indigenous doctors to occupy their space and do it unapologetically and not ask permission to want more, um, but, but also being humble in the fact that we stand on the shoulder of giants, so be humble in that fact as well. Um, two, um, what are the avenues, of, like what are the pathways and training pathways available to us? And are we kind of siloing and smalling and making ourselves small and why? Um, and to get the right people around you, uh, your family, your friends, your professional kind of, your colleagues um, and your mentors make a big difference in this journey. Um, but like I said, when you know who you are and own your space, you kind of create that environment and the people around you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of food for thought there. Um, and, and I appreciate you taking the moment to articulate um, your ideas and your um, directions of thought. So thank you. Um, we're going to go right over to um, uh, Aotearoa now, to Dunedin. Um, and I'm handing over to you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, e mihi ana ki a tātou ngā tini whanau ngā e pono mai uh, ki tēnei kaupapa i tēnei rā. E mihi hoki ki ngā whinoa takitaki uh, i whakahau maru mai i a tātou i tēnei wā awangawanga. Um, ka mihi hoki ki ngā tūpuna e kahatiaki i a tātou i ngā wā katoa. Kia ora everybody, um, I'm a junior doctor currently living in Dunedin over in Aotearoa, living and working um, on Ngai Tahu Whenua amongst Ngai Tahu people. My whanau um, are from Taitukiro, from the far north of New Zealand. Um, and it's just such a privilege and honour to be here to listen um, to my tuakana and friends um, speaking the Lyme conference I attended for the first time as a second year medical student um, and it certainly shaped my career and continues to do so in terms of the people that I've been able to meet, the ideas that I've been exposed to and I always find the space very valuable um, and affirming and I appreciate uh, the honesty that we can have with one another when we're amongst peers. Um, this question was such an awesome, hard-hitting question and such an important one. And I guess for me, what I really love about it is it centres the question of us as Indigenous people first. So it's not as a doctor, as this, as that. It really centres who we are as Indigenous people. Um, and I guess for myself, and potentially I can't speak on behalf of anybody else, but potentially for others as well, I um, came into medicine really understanding that there was something about the way 
uh, that the system had worked in the past or had been working that really um, didn't create the best outcomes for Indigenous people. Um, and so right at the centre there's this tension of how do we kind of occupy or live or work within this space that traditionally hasn't sort of created the best outcomes for Indigenous peoples. And I think for me, it's that that's at the centre of this question. Um, I was listening to a podcast from a Māori broadcaster the other day and she was saying, oh, you know that you're in a um, safe environment as an Indigenous person when you can just breathe out a sigh of relief. And I guess I want to think about or talk about some of the places and experiences that have allowed me to breathe a sigh of relief as an Indigenous person in medicine. Uh, like many of my colleagues have already said, um, got to find your tribe, you've got to find the people, the whanau, um, who can support you. So I chose to work in Dunedin Hospital because that's where my family are. Um, it's where my connections are. I know the community and it's the place where I can be myself and where my platform is the strongest at home so that when I'm strong at home, I can do my job at work and I can do it to the best possible way that I can. I think forums like Lyme and Pride Oc um, and Te Ora or the Māori Doctors Association, Aboriginal Doctors Association forums are just really awesome places to kind of laugh with people who are like you. Um, and also to make connections so that, because sometimes, and as many people have alluded to, it's, it's not easy and you need those, um, you need those other lights to be shining in other areas so that you know um, that you're on the right path, doing the right thing. Uh, and then I guess another thing that I'd like to add is we also need to remember that even if those people aren't in medicine or we haven't met them yet, they're in the community. Um, there's people in all areas, um, education within sort of flex roots initiatives in the community. We're probably asking the same questions and fighting for the same things that we're fighting for on the inside. So the most important thing is that we don't let ourselves be or feel isolated and that we find solace in those who are asking the same questions. Because uh, for me, it's about how, how can I be Indigenous within this space, but still carry hope um, and still want to transform it and, and create something better and bigger. And while I'm certainly not transforming things at the moment, I'm definitely finding the others, which I think is really important. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to talk about is, um, and I think Dr. Kane spoke about this, is having a why. This is so important um, to be able to centre yourself or have that true north or know where you're headed. Uh, for us as Māori, we always talk about our, um, our waka voyaging traditions and where we came from. We always talk about this sort of scientific endeavour of our ancestors across the ocean. Um, they knew that there was land there, but they didn't know exactly where it was, but they had generations of science and observation and poured it all in stories that told them that that land would be there. So they got together the right people and the right skills and stayed on their why and they made it to Aotearoa, back to the islands, back and forth over multiple generations. So for us as Māori doctors, we know that it's in our ancestry to be able to reach beyond the horizon as long as we stuck to the why. Um, and for me, that why has come sort of quite recently through a series of having the right mentorship in the right environment on my placement um, as a second year doctor in paediatrics. And it was really one of the first runs that I've been on where I could feel the kind of clinical and cultural aspects of who I am come together in a way that I felt like this could be the right career for me. I was lucky to be mentored by one of Aotearoa's few um, paediatricians and who is Māori, sorry, and I was able to see this flash of light of, oh, my why is about contributing to the health and well-being of Māori children from the day they're born, um, right throughout their childhood. And so now I'm centred on something that even on the hardest of days, um, I can keep going back to that. And then I guess there's just a couple of lessons or extra points that I wanted to talk about in terms of getting there. Um, one is a a kupu or a word or a phrase that one of my aunties who's been working in the communities for sort of 50 years 
taught me, and it's called Radical Manakitanga. Um, Manakitanga is to uplift the sort of inherent value in others, and obviously to be radical is to do it in a way that transforms things. And so I think for me, at the heart of this question is, how can I be in an environment uh, that allows me to exercise radical manakitanga every day um, so that I can help create the best outcomes for Māori people? And then the second one um, is something that was taught to me in, by the Mihi team in Christchurch, or the Māori and Indigenous Health Institute team, um, Dr Tanya Hudi and Dr Suzanne Pitama. And for them, they always taught us that Clinical competence is cultural competence. We can't take these things apart. For us to be, we can't um, do what's best for Māori communities, for Indigenous communities, if we're not also doing our job as doctors. And I think as junior doctors in particular, and this has also been touched on, we need to remember that we're learning. Um, this, we're new to this craft and we need to keep building our skills and expertise through teaching and learning and peer reflection and things like that. Um, because if we're not doing the basics of our medical role, then how can we be truly culturally competent um, as well for our people? Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Um, awesome corridor so far. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um... And um, you make me um, remember being face to face in our conferences. And um, I have to confess a, a certain um, regret for not being able to be in the room with this group of people and with our attendees. There is something very special about Lyme conferences, as all of you um, who've been will remember. Um, and I, I guess part of what I miss, you know, in terms of the face-to-face -face, um, environment is the opportunity to um, find, as, as you say, solidarity and solace um, in, in uh, a safe space uh, with a bit of laughter thrown in to keep us all going. Um, now, I... I am lucky enough to have known Dr. Priest for many years as well. And um, he's our final panelist and I'm handing over to him really as our final panelist. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. I've got a high tech slideshow. <laughs> um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Joshua Priest. I'm a graduate in Torres Strait Islander man although I grew up in Rockhampton on Durumbal country um, and currently live and work on Gadigal country in Sydney um, and I'm working as a panel physician at, at Bupa. Um, I think that most, if not all, of Australia's uh, corporates and hospitals and health organisations are achieving or working hard to achieve um, Indigenous employment targets. Um, I find that I don't have to make the argument of why Indigenous representation and Indigenous perspectives matter when now welcomed through the front door, but there are very few organisations um, that could claim to be achieving a gold standard in terms of work environment and work supports um, for junior Indigenous staff and I think even senior Indigenous staff. Um, so thank you to Lyme um, and Dr. Bandler for putting together this panel to, to grapple with this question um, about what that ideal work environment might look like and why it isn't like that today. Um, I think as some of the other panellists have said, um, the right work environment is incredibly important for a junior doctor, especially in hospitals, um, because they're rigidly uh, hierarchical. Uh, if there's a negative culture, it flows downward. Uh, and as the most junior person on a team, we often bear, bear the brunt of that. Um, I wanted to focus on all of the things that I've seen and experienced that have made me feel really positive about being at work. Um, so we have a bi-monthly Indigenous book club, um, and that has about 30 employees that joins via a video link. Um, and in addition to making me read more First Nations literature, which I've been meaning to do for ages, um, which has been great. It's also nice to catch up with other people in the organisation who are genuinely 
committed to being exposed to Indigenous, a, a, a variety of Indigenous voices and perspectives. Um, earlier this year, um, everyone in the organisation had a specific hour allocated to them by their managers that was protected from clinical duties where we did a one hour module created by SBS on Indigenous history and Indigenous culture. And it sparked some good conversations because it was somewhat surprisingly for all of those who've, who have experienced death by module, it was surprisingly a, quite a high quality module. It was frank and it was honest about the darker chapters of Australia's uh, history. And we need to and should be acknowledging that in, um, in the way we practice healthcare. Um, and in the way we interact with our with our patients, not not just us, but our, our non-indigenous colleagues as well. Um, Dr. Evelyn Scott, who is a political activist um, involved in the 1967 referendum and the first Aboriginal woman to receive a state funeral in Queensland. Um, later in life, she was a resident at one of Booper's aged care homes in Cairns. Um, so Booper offers um, scholarships in her name each year for Indigenous uni students interested in health careers. And we have a panel session where we hear from the scholarship recipients. I think that every business and every hospital has stories of Indigenous contribution weaved throughout their history. And I think that spotlighting that history and making it a part of how a workplace is thinking about the next generation of Indigenous contributions is something that I'd like to see more of. So these are all things that on their own are small, um, but collectively they send a signal to me that my workplace is happy to invest in more than just one painting on a wall and happy to do ongoing work outside of NAIDOC week or reconciliation week. And I'd encourage um, people to think about, you know, are, are you in a workplace where you are just being engaged with a one NAIDOC week morning tea each year? because that's never been good enough and it's certainly not good enough now. Um, we should be genuinely engaged with on a monthly or a bi-monthly basis to get our input, to support us, to build a genuine Indigenous presence and community in our workplaces, in the hospitals, the clinics and the businesses that we're a part of. Um, in terms of the right work supports, um, I was very fortunate last year uh, when I was at the Royal Melbourne Hospital to be mentored by Glenn Harrison, who's Australia's first Indigenous emergency physician, um, and have the peer support of Gabby Ebsworth, who is the sole, uh, is, is the sole Aboriginal health liaison officer at the hospital. Um, I think that, you know, last year would have been a lot harder if I didn't have them to laugh with, decompress with, share the workplace successes uh, and workplace stresses with. Um, but supporting me was not in their job descriptions. Um, that's something that they were doing off their own bat because as Indigenous healthcare workers, they were committed to seeing, um, you know, me as an Indigenous health, another Indigenous healthcare worker succeed as well. Um, so if I were to encourage hospitals and health services to reflect on one thing, it's that you can't rely on your junior Indigenous staff members to look after each other in our spare time with no resources. I think we need a small, but importantly protected amount of time to engage with each other. Um, and we need dedicated spaces we can engage with each other in. Um, uh, something that was really nice last year uh, was when Gabby, the a AHLO, organised um, for uh, a large pin featuring Indigenous art for each Indigenous staff member at the hospital um, that we could wear attached to our hospital IDs that allowed us, um, you know, as Indigenous staff members, if we wanted to, the chance to publicly and proudly identify ourselves um, when we were on the wards. Um, And then lastly, I just wanted to leave on the note about the promise that is made to us as junior, junior Indigenous staff members. I think that Indigenous recruitment statistics can't be our sole yardstick for success. Uh, just having Indigenous people in, the, in an organisation can't be the end goal. When you make statements in your job advertisements that you encourage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to apply, you're making a promise. You're making a promise 
that you have created a workplace where Indigenous staff can be part of the team without assimilating. You're making a promise that there'll be a culture waiting for us where we can be our full selves and contribute our full selves. Um, and I urge you to keep the promise. Thank you, Dr. Price, as always. And, um, and thank you for having a slideshow. That was remarkable. Um, a little unexpected, but remarkable. Thank you. Um, and, and I guess now we're really interested in um, picking up some of the threads mm -hmm. of what each of you have talked about. And I guess one of the threads is about uh, a sense of working with people with shared values. And I think that's, you know, something that, um, you know, you mentioned Dr. Robinson working with other people who care um, and, and how important it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that, for example, I, I, for me in my practice, I find it, it really important that every person in the practice, including medical receptionists and administrators, as well as the nursing and other clinical staff, all have that same badge. And I guess I, I'm wondering what each of you might have thought about when you haven't had that, that experience and what, what sort of things you've tried to do about it and, and what sort of ways you've tried to address working amongst people who don't share your values. Who wants to go first? <laughs> right, I'll go first. I was That's just it. about to nominate. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, look, I, I'm not going to lie. I've just come from a place that was very much like that, where, you know, it's a little bit vanilla. There's not much sort of cultural um, expression. And so I feel like the way I approached it was every little part of my work and my day job, I would make sure that I would insert something cultural in every single part. Um, whether that be discussing um, some Indigenous health related topics with the interns, whether that be um, talking with patients from other cultures, um, because I often found that a lot of patients would um, identify me as um, as indigenous, but also as from other cultures. And so they recognize otherness. And so being, re able, being able to relate to that was also important. Um, I think with each of my consultants that I worked with last year, just talking about little sprigs of my purpose with them um, and, you know, identifying um, different cultural or, um, different aspects of Indigenous health within vascular surgery. So bringing that up as a discussion point um, was also important. And then also I had, um, I worked with a fellow last year who had come over from England um, and it was quite funny, his perception of race in Australia and, um, and what he had observed in, during his time here um, he had reflected on it a lot. And so I, I found that I was having quite deep conversations with him and the other non-Indigenous trainees um, at the hospital as well. And so I, I felt like there was a very deep cross-cultural um, connection there with those guys. And so I was able, I felt like I was able to leave a few people more informed um, about Indigenous issues or Indigenous health issues um, and culture um, than before I came there. So I don't know, that's my approach was just sort of little sprinkles of Indigenous culture um, throughout everything. Just enough to keep you going. Just enough to, yeah, keep myself sane, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess... Uh... Probably one of the difficult things about being a junior doctor is you're pretty much starting a new job every three months and there's a new way of doing things, a new team, a new dynamic. Um, and it can be quite awkward and uncomfortable just figuring out like where do you fit in um, to all of this as well. Um, 
I do think it's important to remember that the team's not just the medical team, <laughs> and that often, but not always, um, the nursing staff and administrative staff and cleaning staff on the wards um, are more diverse than perhaps the medical staff. Um, and as I said, just always go back to find the others because they're there um, and it's just whether you're able to find them or not. And I think you can't underestimate sort of um, just the power of having a really good laugh with someone that you share culture with. Um, and they can really make some of your more difficult runs um, a lot more bearable. And I guess, sorry, on that, the runs are difficult for lots of reasons. It might be your first job, big workload or, or whatever, yeah. I've just found as well over the years, sort of both in my hospital years and now sort of working in community and in Aboriginal health, I found um, just, uh, you know, when people seem to not, be engaged or not interested um, um, you know we've myself and other people have sort of instigated just small things like um, I know when I was doing pediatrics uh, my pediatric rotation in the hospital we instigated a um, one day a week just learning the Yongle language and it started off with sort of like myself and one of the consultants and a couple of other staff members and and um, we had like a one of my um, family members come in and we just do like language for staff and I mean despite the fact that there's many languages Yongle being one of the more common languages up here um, you know we would just do a lesson learn a couple of words how to say hello goodbye how are you feeling um, some anatomical words and then within a couple of weeks there was you know 20 people coming so which showed you know potentially that people were actually really interested in learning and you know as part of that we did a bit of cultural learning and that as well and i was really um impressed by how many people turned up and how interested they were and how invested people were in learning a bit of language and engaging more with some of the patients that were coming to the clinic and coming to the hospital. So I think that was just the simplest little thing, but had a really, you know, uh, sparked a lot of interest. And I guess, uh, you, you know, I'm conscious that um, particularly for you, both um, Dr. Kane and Dr. Robinson, you working um, with a lot of Aboriginal patients and and uh, a heavy burden of disease and and uh, often many challenges, um, both you know clinically and in every aspect of their life. And I'm wondering how each of you have thought about um some of the burden of that when you see your patients who um who you I, I i guess identify more closely with and think about more closely um than some of your uh, colleagues might and i might take that question to you dr milroy in the first place i guess because you know thinking about um some of the challenges that we see in general practice um, I'm just thinking about how you might have thought about that and, and importantly, how you go home at night. Um, look, I think as, as everybody's kind of touched on today um, about their like why and why they joined, why they wanted to do medicine and, and in general, it seems like everyone's coming from that kind of social justice perspective and, and wanting to make a difference and wanting to, um, you know, give back and, and contribute back to their, their communities. Um, I think in terms of seeing your Aboriginal patients that um, are more or more complex and, and you really um, have a have a deep, deep kind of empathy and, and connection to them. Um, for me, like in my in my current uh, workplace, my my practice staff are very aware of um, my my values and my kind of clinical drive. And so if I um, am having longer appointments prioritized for original patients or um, 
take taking them as walk-ins or you know whatever it is um i don't i don't mind and they know i don't mind <laughs> um and i'm and i'm happy happy to do it and they know that the reason i'm happy to do it is because it's about um equity and it's about that the these patients need this care and attention um but then in terms of yeah taking on that load and and going home at night um it it's it's difficult i guess it's like with all um you know stressful work days or um you know um intense kind of clinical encounters you have to take that time to kind of debrief and and take the time to you know reflect on it um and i think you know the one of the other kind of themes through this session has been mentorship and you you talk to your clinical mentors and your supervisors and you um find out ways to kind of um process this um and i think the real payoff though is that you you see the difference that you're making with with patients they 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 come back and they are more engaged and you you know all of these kind of theoretical things that you read about in terms of cultural safety and um you know patient care you it, it's it's reality I'll um, pick up on that one as well, Dr. Bandler. I think when I first came up here um, with the burden of disease with regards to complications of diabetes, um, it was very, very eye-opening. And for me, I also found it quite um, traumatic personally, like being an Aboriginal doctor um, coming in and operating on Aboriginal feet, um, which, you know, in vascular surgery, um, it's unfortunate, but a lot of the procedures we do include things like amputations and debridement. So you're sort of constantly removing tissue. Um, it was very, um, very confronting and very traumatizing in the first instance, seeing a lot of infection related um, pathology. And so, you know, for a good time there, I um, had to debrief with you know, my, my consultant, who's also a very close mentor of mine now. Um, and, and now like I've, uh, over the course of my time here, I've been able to rationalize the importance of doing these procedures because the alternative is you leave an infection there and then it's only going to get worse. It's not going, it, and the only way to cure it is with, with steel and not, and not medications. And so, you know, um, I, I've rationalised it in terms of, you know, there's a need for surgery. Um, and if, if I don't do it with the therapeutic relationship that I have with the patients, um, the deep therapeutic relationship I have on a cultural level with patients, then some average Joe surgical registrar who really doesn't have that much of an interest in cultural or cultural connections or anything is going to come and do this procedure and, you know, whack it on their logbook and not really care about the outcomes in the end. And so I'd much rather be the person doing it and seeing the patient rather than someone else coming in and not, not really worrying and just worrying about logbook numbers as opposed to, as opposed to long-term outcomes. And I think Justin, like some of what you've talked on before as well is like identifying these kind of like allies in your workplace as well. So like people that you can debrief with, but also like, mm -hmm. um, I think Deja Ann talked about like occu occupying your space and being unapologetic about that. So um, as you're moving through your medical career, I think now I'm becoming more aware of, I guess, like the privilege that I have as, mm -hmm. you know, progressing to my senior registrar years and then into fellowship, how can I um, leverage that? um kind of um yeah seniority i guess to to make other people accountable um so whether yeah. it be like specialists and questioning them on their commitment to um you know our, our close the gap targets and and things like yeah. that how are they going to contribute back to this space and as you say like pro providing bits of education that might um you know help with this this advocacy <laughs> um for the patients that we're seeing 
Yeah. Um, yeah, hundred percent agree. And you know, the here in the territory, there's only one vascular surgeon in the entire Northern Territory, and um, he's he's a Kiwi Pakeha man from um, from Aotearoa. And I feel like because of his upbringing in Aotearoa um, and understanding of like Maori culture and Tereo and just how um, important the Treaty of Waitangi um, is in Aotearoa, I feel like he's brought that same sort of cultural um, understanding to Australia. And although it's different, the way in which he communicates with patients is amazing. And I've never seen a Pakeha doctor or a Gabba doctor do that before. And so, um, so I feel like having him around, um, like I feel comfortable being an Aboriginal person around him as well, because he, he understands culture um, and, and works with all of these patients up here and provides an excellent service for them. And so um, debriefing with him was an important part of this because, you know, it's our, it's our standard practice up here and it's, it's a shame. And I like, it's a shame to, to say it, but you know, most of the fistulas we make and the feet that we operate on are black arms and black, black feet. And so it's, it's unfortunate, but it's just something part of the life up here in the Territory. Yes, and I guess um, what you've emphasised actually is just the fact that you bring something to the consultation that other people don't or, or won't or can't. Um, and, and I guess, you know, holding on to that and holding that close and recognising that is an important part of this. I guess, um, you, you know, you, you talked, uh, Dr. Priest, about the workspace and about NAIDOC week and, and some of that, uh, and all of you really, in some ways, touched on issues around cultural loading and, and, and thinking about, you know, your place in the wider organisation that you work with or work for. And, and I'm wondering how you've come to think about that and care for yourselves and think about, you know, your place um, in an organisation, your, your responsibilities and your duties. And, um, and I'll just open it up to each of you, but we might start with you, um, Dr. Dalton, just to, um, uh, you know, think about what that means for you in your day to day work. Yeah, I think I, uh, you know, sitting here listening to everyone, sort of, you, you bring back memories of examples in the workplace that um, I suppose when you think of cultural awareness in the workplace for the non-Indigenous team members, <clears throat> I've had two, two examples come to mind, particularly one was um, another surgical rotation with um, an Indigenous lady, um, but with a lot of mental health issues, but very much being pushed out the door. Um, and, you know, primarily you think, well, from a mental health perspective, you need to sort something out from that as well. But the commentary that came from that um, in regards to um, an Indigenous person, um, you know, this is how they live. Um, this is their normal. Um, it, um, it, we've all experienced this sort of behaviour in the workplace and having to correct it, I think, um, is always difficult um, because it's taxing on you um, as an individual because it falls to you to then make, make that change. And the, and the second example was another uh, Indigenous patient who came in um, with, uh, who'd been assaulted, heavily intoxicated, but was being again treated, cleared by imaging from CT brain, chest x-rays, um, or not chest x-ray, actually, I'll come to that. Um, but continued to complain of right-sided chest pain and just spending the time talking to, to that patient, um, uh, you know, at, at, on a cultural level, you can actually sit there and understand where they're coming from and realising then they had a couple of broken ribs uh, that were chronic and hadn't been treated every time they presented um, to ED. Um, so it's been missed every, every single time. And I suppose then when I look at uh, what we're discussing about um, that awareness and um, being that, that, that advocate um, 
and, and having that cultural appropriation, so to speak, um, it, it is it's hard. Um, and what Dr. Clanton was talking about um, in owning that space, you, you do own that space and, and you have your why in regards to um, being a doctor, but um, it does become tiring. And I think having um, senior Indigenous doctors, uh, our colleagues, really does help you pull through uh, the, those situations. And feeling a sense of alliance. Definitely. Um, you know, it's where I'm working now is great, but it's not as much as an Indigenous focus as where I've worked or where I'm about to be going. And I do feel a bit of, um, uh, yeah, out of place, so to speak, while I'm here, but I'm here for a reason to get some particular training. Um, and it is hard to build the like-mindedness with some of the, some of my colleagues, but, but, you know, I do find when you do start engaging those conversations, they're very receptive to it on the majority, which is good. And you can build, build the alliances relatively quickly there too. And Dr. Clanton, you're on mute. Yeah, I'll, I'll just tag on to Dr. Dalton's comments. And um, like I said, it, when you people, when we talk about owning our space, there's also that underlying um, at what cost. And I think that's what our colleagues have um, expressed today. There is a lot of work that goes into occupying one space and doing it unapologetically and people need to understand the work that goes into that, um, the energy that it's required to continue that. And some days when you're dealing with these constant microaggressions, there are battles that you think you should fight, but you don't have the energy to. And that's where that conversation of the battle weary comes into play. And then you walk away from that situation going, I should have said something. Should I have said something? I think, I know I should have said something, but I know that I've got like four more fights today. Do I have the energy to do this one as well? Mm -hmm. And so the power it has to have consultants who are culturally competent and safe, that's one less battle we have to fight because it's just not anyone coming in to talk. It's a consultant and it goes into play that hierarchy and the power it, it has for a consultant and international doctor to be so culturally aware and create a safe space, not only for you as a junior doctor, but to your patients as well. And I remember one time I just started Gen Med and it was just a little interaction with this consultant that made me think, oh, wow, I've chosen the right hospital. Because he was like, oh, we're going in to see this young indigenous gentleman. He's got so and this, this, this and this. Um, I think it's better um, that I just go in by myself, Dave. He might be a little bit uncomfortable with a young female as yourself um, coming into what we're about to discuss. And I was like, oh, that makes a big difference. I didn't even have to, like, I just, under, he understood. Um, I didn't even have to explain the situation and he directed um, where this needed to go because he was, um, he had taken the time to learn and understand what it meant to be culturally safe. Um, the kind of negative things that you encounter. So again, the like Dr. Dalton said, there's been plenty of scenarios where you're just like, really, really, this is coming out of people's mouths in 2021. Like, but you just, again, being there and challenging them, not necessarily um, exerting a lot of energy. I had a pharmacist, again, our colleagues are just not doctors. They're nurses, pharmacists, and, and so forth. Um, I needed to discuss some medications for a patient, and the patient had come on um, had come in with uh, alcohol-induced pancreatitis. And she goes, "Oh, is the patient Aboriginal?" And I went, "Actually, no." And it was just her, just to call her out, and just a simple, "Actually, no." And Oh, but no, and I just can be just placing the fact that okay, she's had to check herself in front of me, um, and I know she had to kind of think about a few things. And I uh, was just like, not all Indigenous people are like this, and no, this patient isn't Indigenous. And you could see her like ticking over and realizing, oh, I think I've made a mistake, and I've left it there, and 
um, later she's obviously come back to try and be my friend and I was just like, nah, um, I'm not doing this. But you know, it's just that, <laughs> it's just the inter daily interaction you have to do and be like, okay, I can plant this here. I don't need to explain myself. No, this is not correct. And just leave the situation and allow people to reflect on what they've actually done. But on the flip side, that to have that representation, when we say about purpose and making change, um, just to see, you know, when you walk past your mob and you just like see their eyes light up because they've seen you. They've seen you walk past their ED bed or they've seen you on rounds and, um, you know, there's been a few occasions where you just, you know, whispers, countrymen stand like, you know, come here, bub. Um, you are Bruce Rock? <laughs> yes, I am. And they just, oh, you know, we're so shame, but we wanted to ask and that's where the, the power of representation is. And um, not only do you get to experience that, which makes your kind of purpose, um, you know, even worth more, like worth it, but your colleagues get to see that interaction as well. And they understand where that power lies um, in the future engagements from there. Um, just picking up from what you were saying there, Dr. Clanton, I feel like with those sort of interactions now, like, you know, our days are already so busy with our clinical mm -hmm. duties. Like we don't have to like, and there's always an added level of stress just because we're mob and, you know, sometimes we don't clock off at five o'clock. Yeah. Like we have to, like, we take things home as well. And then we have to deal like, not that it's a bad thing, but then we also have to, you know, have yarn to mob when we get back to community about health things as well. But I find with those sort of um, racist interactions, and they're not always microaggressions, they could be flat out macroaggressions as well. Like they could be macro. Um, and I've had a couple of instances just in the last couple of weeks where I've had, I've had to do that as well. And I think, you know, unfortunately, med medicine is a very hierarchical structure. And I've been to a couple of presentations recently where um, people have spoken about how hierarchies um, are breeding grounds for implicit biases. Um, so I think I always thought that was really interesting. But as I'm like, as I feel like I'm getting more senior um, now, and also I feel like I'm in a stage of life where I'm like I'm so culturally strong within myself because I know my mob and where I'm from and all of that sort of stuff and the work that I'm doing I feel like when I have those interactions it can be a one-way street like I don't need to exert any more energy I'm like look this is this is what I've interpreted this is my take on it this is what I suggest you do this is not a back and forth like this is me sending this to you and I'm going to keep going on with my operating list. Like that's the, that's the stage I'm at. It's like, you know, this isn't a to and from, this isn't a negotiation. Like this is what's happened. And this, is, this is what it is. Yeah. is and this what is what you, know, you, yeah. you know, an explanation. It is what it is. And <laughs> yeah. <I'm> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. And Dr. Robinson. Um, I found uh, look, I mean, I think just working the nature of the environment up here is um, like um, Justin said, we're on a day to day basis in the work that I'm doing is with um, Indigenous patients, working with uh, Aboriginal health practitioners, um, particularly where I'm working at the moment, there are a lot of Aboriginal staff uh, as well. So it's it, it, people are pretty good where I work usually because we're just sort of in amongst that and I guess in my experience up here as well the people that generally choose to do um, rural and remote medicine and work in Aboriginal health have um, you know done that for a reason but that said um, you know I know there's been a couple of instances uh, where I'm working currently where uh, you know I've, I've called out just blatant racism and um, like uh, Deja and Justin have alluded to, I think sort of as you get, you get to a point where you're so, uh, you know, culturally strong and assured that it's just not 
I've, I've come to the place now where I'm just happy to just call it out in, in the most appropriate way, uh, you know, generally just to say, look, that's not appropriate. Let them have a bit of a reflect on that. It's, it's, and just basically calling people out for when they've expressed something that's inappropriate or just plain out racist. Um, but, you know, that, I mean, I experienced that a lot more when I was in the hospital environment, but I think um, where I am now, like I said, most people are doing the work that I'm in now have actually chosen to do that. And I mean, it's very challenging and, um, you know, there's lots of challenges and you bring a lot of things home and there's just massive overwhelming chronic disease and um, a particular challenge I think that I face as well is that um, I work with a lot of people from my own community, uh, come across, you know, family members and things like that on a daily basis sometimes. Um, there's extra challenges that come with that as well and complications. But um, yeah, and I think that part of that as well is just knowing your boundaries with other people, with your clients, with your patients, with other staff members as well. And I think as a Indigenous medical professional, I think you have to hone those skills more quickly than maybe your other colleagues do because there are so many challenges um, and different complexities that you face on a day-to-day -day basis. I think you either sort of, it drives you down or you need to sort of, sort of rise up a bit and be like, nah, this is, this is who I am and this is what my belief system are and this is what I'm willing to tolerate and this is what I'm not willing to tolerate and I think I'm becoming better at that as I move forward in my career. Yes I, I think that's um, you, you know that's what you would hope that as you um, develop as a clinician you also develop in those sort of skills as well. Um, and, and I just wanted to um, turn to something that you mentioned Dr Priest um, about the promise that that is made um, when uh, an organisation says we encourage um, Indigenous applicants and think about how that actually might play out in, um, in a hospital setting. I mean, I know you now don't work in a hospital setting, but do you think there are things that you would have liked to have seen in the hospital setting or in, a, in one that you might work in in the future that would make a difference um, and keep that promise? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going back into the hospitals uh, in February um, for, to start um, my psychiatry registrar uh, job. So I'll, I'll be back into the thick of things soon. Um, but in terms of, I, I love hearing everyone's stories, uh, you know, about how you've all, you know, dealt with or stood up for yourselves when you, when you run into those micro and macro aggressions. But I'm, I'm always disappointed um, in organisations that perpetuate a culture where they permit it to happen and expect us to be the first and only line of defence against it. Um, I remember last year we had a, one of our weekly intern teaching sessions was on dealing with adversity and bullying. And I thought, hang on, <laughs> maybe instead of teaching all the interns to deal with bullying, you could teach the consultants not to bully us. So that might be a more direct <laughs> approach. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think that one, one, of, one of your questions was how you find, how you find peace. And for me, I find peace just by recognizing that as a junior person it's it's not my job to change the culture it's the institution's job to change the culture um and i find peace by noting sort of the best behavior i find in sort of the best clinicians that are respectful and great in what they do um and noticing the worst um and committing to never be like that and committing to 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 you know, be be one of the best. And I, I think by making that promise to myself, that's how I find peace that, you know, someday all of us will be one of the most powerful people in the hospitals and organisations that we work for. Um, and what we choose to do with that power when we have it, I think is um, is how I find peace. And, and I guess laying down those principles and values to live by for when you are the most powerful people in the hospital or in healthcare. And look, I frankly look forward to that day. 
Um, one of the things that you mentioned, Dr. Jackson, was really um, around, you know, finding that right person and and finding that person who would then act as your advocate and and just i'm just wondering how that really informed you thinking about your own future as a senior clinician yeah i'm loving all the talk so far um, and definitely relate to all of it um i think Something that's definitely still the case in New Zealand is the reality is most of Māori health is in the hands of non-Māori people because most non most doctors are non-Māori as it stands at the moment. Um, we don't have parity in terms of our doctor practicing population. And so we actually need buy-in from our non-Māori colleagues or our non-Indigenous colleagues to do the work because we, especially as young people coming through, cannot take on all of that role and burden and things like that. Um, and through finding the right people in the right place, I've learned that um, medics love evidence. You know, nothing like a good audit to show the differences in outcomes or what you're doing within a department to kind of highlight to people for people to be able to get on board. Um, and we don't know who our allies are if we don't float conversations. and it's, I find for myself personally, because I can go down the rabbit hole of getting quite cynical quite fast, um, and I need to stay positive and kind of proactive, get on top of things before I'm reacting to a macroaggression or a microaggression. And sometimes floating conversations about the things that you're really interested in, like some really awesome research in New Zealand around um, perinatal outcomes, um, particularly in Indigenous health and same as in Australia, as well and so through planting these little discussions you kind of start to see who the others are and then you can kind of start to ripple out that way and so i guess it's through and you know the the hidden curriculum in medicine is so powerful and we shouldn't underestimate that and um deja you spoke about um you know the mob's eyes seeing you i've seen that i've seen whanau maori look at me and you know oh so proud of you bub or what, and then you know, oh man, I've got to be on. <laughs> I've got to be the best goddamn doctor that I'm ever going to be, even if I don't have the skills yet, because these expectations are high. Like, um, yeah, so I think just being, being comfortable in yourself to be able to plant those little seeds or little conversations with people, because sometimes those people aren't the other Indigenous people in your department. Sometimes they're another colleague or a consultant, and you thought, oh man, that was completely left field. But, We've just kind of boxed, as, as we think that people box us, maybe we've boxed them as well. Um, and I've definitely found a lot of people through kind of taking that sort of more proactive approach. And I think for myself personally, it's a more sustainable road forward um, because the cultural loading is difficult and we all experience, you know, um, oh, hey, it's Māori, you know, we want to focus on Māori health. Do you want to do this or what about this? Um, but we also shouldn't underestimate the power of bringing other people into the conversation as we search for experts in, you know, this person's got a heart condition, we'll call the cardiologist in. Um, we should feel the same about um, Indigenous knowledge keepers as well as experts that come in, um, because for all of us, we'll be in a different part of our kind of cultural strength, cultural journey, there's dynamics about, you know, I'm. From, from a different tribal area to the tribal area that I'm practicing in. There's all these kind of nuances that we inherently know about and carry as Indigenous people. Um, yeah, so I, I like to um, plant seeds on my terms, <laughs> I guess, rather than feeling kind of defensive and upset. Um, and it goes back to, to, yeah, that cultural and clinical competence are hand in hand. Look, I, I think that, you, you know, that's really um, perfect. And, and, and to be honest, Dr. Jackson, I think we should finish there. Um, you've really pulled that together for us. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the themes that have gone through our conversation are consistent. And, and I think that we've gone um, with your generosity, frankly, from all of you, 
um, we've gone a long way to answering the question. So um, we're farewelling um, Dr. Dalton immediately. He's got to rush to theatres, so thank you. Um, but also I'd like to thank each of you, um, the panellists, um, because you've given not just your um, intellectual uh, and energy, but also your emotional energy and your commitment and your, your um, depth of engagement and thought is truly appreciated and, um, and, and something that I've really uh, treasured the opportunity to be party to. Um, so we're, I'll just let you all relax now, thank you. Um, we've just got a little bit of work for our attendees to do um, because they need to um, just uh, complete a survey. And the survey is in the link. Um, and uh, I think that um, if you would just take, I think it's got about four questions. If you just take a minute to answer them, that would be great. Um, and I, I guess too, I would uh, encourage our attendees to remember that um, the session is um, recorded. Um, if there are bits that you've missed or bits you'd like to listen to again, and I know, and I know I, there are bits I will go back to, um, we, would, um, we will be posting it and we will be um, putting it up and it will be available to you as our attendees. Um, can I also just take this moment to thank also um, our uh, supporters um, and uh, recognise that they contribute uh, to all that we do all the time. And I am very grateful to also our uh, sponsors. This year we've had um, a remarkable array of sponsors and I'm, I'm really uh, wouldn't like to pass this moment without recognising that they contribute in a really useful and, 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 and helpful way. Um, and, and certainly as an organisation, Lyme is very grateful. Um, so uh, without um, really anything um, more, I'd like to finish the session to, um, to once again, thank each and every one of the panellists. Um, you lived up to my hopes and dreams and went far beyond that. And I am very grateful and, and pleased to be um, a vehicle for hearing from you and giving you the opportunity to uh, express some of your ideas and thoughts. Um, we will let the attendees go now and I thank them for their attendance and their interest and their engagement uh, once again with Lime Connection. And we look forward to doing this face-to-face -face in a couple of years, fingers crossed. Thank you.